Rolling. This is the Fed Sock Films Podcast. Where we continue the conversation sparked, sparked on, on film. film. Quite on set. You want to know what freedom tastes like? It tastes like this beer. Take one. This is, in fact, the classic solution in search of a problem. Action. It cannot help but be controversial. Cut. With expert discussion and analysis. With the greatest legal minds on the topic today. The Fed Sock Films Podcast. It's a wrap. I'm Samantha Schroeder, writer, director, and producer of the film Madison and the Fight for the Constitution, a short documentary that explores how James Madison helped write a new nation into existence and unified the people behind ideals that would change the course of history. Here today to discuss the three lives of James Madison, genius, partisan, and president, is Noah Feldman, author of a book with this very title. Noah is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. He also hosts the Deep Background Podcast, a show that explores the historical, scientific, legal, and cultural context behind the biggest stories in the news. His myriad areas of interest include legal theory, the history of legal thought, constitutional law, and especially relevant to today's episode, constitutional design. Welcome to the show, Professor Feldman. Thank you so much for having me. Noah, what was it about James Madison that made you decide to write a book on him? I'm a constitutions guy. I teach constitutional law as my day job, and I've been studying the constitution for as long as I've uh, been in the profession of law professor. And really, Madison is the most significant figure, if you had to pick one, in the history of the composition of the U.S. Constitution. And although the constitution, of course, was drafted by a group of people and ratified by the whole country, the basic conception, the architecture, if you will, for what became our constitution was Madison's innovative work of genius. And so I think if you want to grapple with our constitution and how it came into existence, you need to start with the man himself. So would you say Madison is the indispensable of all the founding fathers? Indispensability is always a tricky term because you can ask if there had been no Madison, would someone else have produced a draft for a constitution? I think the answer is very possibly yes. Mm -hmm. But it was in fact Madison who did more than anyone else to produce what became the Virginia plan that the Virginia delegates brought into the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, and who then was a crucial figure in the process of negotiating and reasoning their way to what became the constitution that they ultimately sent out for ratification. In that sense, yes, he was indispensable to what we actually had. And then he wasn't done because in the first Congress where he was in the House of Representatives, he, having made a campaign promise to his constituents to push for a Bill of Rights, then went through the process of compiling suggestions from all of the states that had engaged in the ratification process and refining them into what became a draft of the Bill of Rights. So not only did he function as the primary drafts person for the Constitution, he also ended up doing the same job for the Bill of Rights. Which aspect of Madison's life and legacy would you say is the most consequential, his genius, his partisanship, or his presidency? They all mattered in different ways. You could certainly say that his genius in producing the architecture of the Constitution and in helping shape what became the American system of federalism was vast was vastly consequential for our country and also for other countries that adopted federalism in the aftermath of the American example. His partisanship came later. It came in the years where he shifted from being a close ally of Alexander Hamilton, who had also been at the Philadelphia Convention and had worked very closely with Madison to get the Constitution ratified. They were the two principal co-authors of the Federalist Papers. John Jay wrote a few, but the vast majority were written by Hamilton and Madison. So he and Madison, who had been close allies, turned into bitter, bitter enemies. And this is how Madison became a partisan. Madison had thought that political parties were a terrible thing, He drafted a constitution that was intended to avoid the emergence of political parties. And when he realized that that had failed and that his differences with Hamilton were so deep that they had to be taken on in a systematic way, he, along with Thomas Jefferson, founded the so-called Democratic Republican Party or the Republican Party for short, the original Republican Party, to fight against the Federalist Party, which was Hamilton's party and also that of George Washington. And so in this period of of his life in the 1790s, and into up till the 2000, sorry, in the 1790s and up till the 1800 election, he was an intensely partisan figure. And in fact, one of the founding characters of American political partisanship. And in a historical moment like ours, where we've become very polarized and partisan again, Mm 
it's really important to acknowledge that Madison played a central role in shaping the way we talk and think about ourselves as divided people. His presidency, which came after he'd spent eight years as Secretary of State to Thomas Jefferson, was consequential primarily because of the War of 1812, which Madison tried to avoid but ended up fighting, and which did not go terribly well for the United States. We invaded Canada twice, neither time did it succeed, and the war ended up in a kind of a stalemate between the U.S. and Britain. And the best thing you could say about that war is that it gave Americans a renewed confidence that they could survive a conflict with Britain. And I would say it was the least important part of his public life, of the three parts of his of his public life, though lots of important stuff happened. So Noah, tell me about the mind of Madison. Is he the greatest political genius in American history? He's among the greatest political geniuses, I would say. We, we had others. Hamilton, I think, was comparable. He did for finance in the United States and financial institutions what Madison did for political institutions. So he has to be counted as comparable uh, in important ways. Abraham Lincoln was also a political genius, it turned out, at conceptualizing what a divided America could become and how to unify it. Um, and there were also 20th century political geniuses as well. You might not think they were good geniuses, but they were nevertheless geniuses. I think FDR is a clear example of that. He transformed American government into something very different from that which he discovered by consolidating a tremendous amount of power in a federal bureaucracy under executive leadership. And there are many critics of that, but it's transformative nature, as I think acknowledged both by people who like the New Deal construction and those who don't like the New Deal construction. So Lincoln is hugely important. FDR is hugely important. Mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson was influential in various ways. But I think that Madison, from a purely intellectual standpoint, may be the most influential and significant. I will say that that does not mean that he was without limitations. You know, he was a person of his era. He was a slaveholder his entire life. His entire wealth depended upon slavery. He was born into the arms of a slave. When he died, a slave closed his eyes. He was never committed to emancipation in any systematic way. And he never fully took on board the consequences of the way that slavery remained embedded in the Constitution mm -hmm. as part of the compromise that he had helped to strike. So to say that he was a genius is not in any way, shape, or form to say that he was perfect. But it is to say that he had ideas that shaped who we are in very fundamental, in a very fundamental fashion. What would you say were Madison's greatest weaknesses? His greatest weakness was that his mechanism of leadership was always based on logic and reason. And he was not very good at convincing people to do things on the basis of other human emotions, what Hamilton would have called the passions. And he didn't have very much respect for political motivations that came out of feeling or passion. And when a problem couldn't be solved by convincing everybody just to be logical about it, he didn't have very good skills at knowing what to do next. And I think that was probably his single greatest weakness that plagued him throughout his political life. And he had a great talent for one-on-one -on -one friendship and a great talent for convincing people in small bodies of rational men to do things, but he did not have a talent for convincing the public as a whole to, to do things. Um, and I think that is also part of the same limitation in his character. When it came to slavery, Madison believed, as did some of the other founders, that because in their world, slavery wasn't very profitable, mm -hmm. it would just go away. And that's not how human beings are, because human beings are motivated by much more than mere logical propositions or, or self-interest. And there were many strong psychological reasons, emotional reasons, and ultimately new economic reasons to maintain slavery. And so that's one of the reasons that his expectation on that front was completely wrong. You mentioned friendship. What role did friendship play in Madison's three lives? At every stage in his life but one, Madison had 
a best friend, a person he was working with in very close, concentrated cooperation to achieve the things that he was setting out to achieve. And that was Edmund Randolph in the early part of his career when he was working on the Constitution. Then it became Alexander Hamilton. Then it became Thomas Jefferson after he and Hamilton fell out. And it was only when he became president that he found himself without a close personal colleague or friend to work beside. And it actually made the first part of his presidency substantially weakened. He, he needed those kinds of close, intimate, thoughtful friendships to effectuate his goals, to make him think clearly and to have a person to work alongside. And it was only in the latter part of his presidency when he convinced James Monroe to join his administration as Secretary of State that he had someone to work with. He and Monroe had this very tricky relationship because they were both protégés of Jefferson mm -hmm. and they were kind of competitive with each other. Or to be more precise, Monroe was competitive with Madison. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when Madison became president, Monroe initially um, didn't have a central role in the administration. He was an ambassador, so he was abroad. And he was kind of bitter when his ambassadorships didn't go that well. And he really was skeptical of entering into the Madison administration in a, in a senior position. And Madison sort of had to seduce him in by promising him that he would pay him a lot of respect. And of course, that paid off for Monroe, who then ended up as president for eight years after Madison. Do you think friendship in the sense that <clears throat> Madison participated and valued them and I guess use them to his ends uh, and goals as leader. Do you think it's missing today in politics? I think it's really rare to find senior figures in our political world who have the kind of extremely close and extremely loyal personal relationships where they talk everything through, act as allies, disagree as friends within that because part of friendship is to be able to disagree at least privately with somebody those kinds of intense relationships are really rare today. But I think, to be fair, they were extremely rare even in Madison's lifetime. Madison was unusual, I would say, in the history of American politicians, important ones at least, in having these kinds of really profound close friendships. And I will add, they sometimes went, went awry. I mean, his friendship mm -hmm. with Hamilton, which is in certain ways an unlikely friendship. Hamilton was outgoing and charismatic and impassioned, both personally and professionally. And Madison was dry and thoughtful and a bit cold and focused on reason rather than the passions. So they were kind of an unlikely friendship, but they became very, very close friends. And then when their political views ended up differing during the Washington administration, they ended up as extremely bitter enemies. Hmm. So, uh, you know, I think those kinds of relationships are unusual in any politician, in any historical era. And I think they were pretty unusual then, but I think they're really rare, extremely rare to find now. Right, because you're putting yourself, you know, at risk, right? You're making yourself vulnerable in friendship, essentially, to a certain extent, loving your neighbor, um, depending on how you're defining friendship, right? Aristotelian friendship. Um, but yeah, it seems like it, it, it was valuable, but then if it goes wrong, it can put you in a, a real position of vulnerability politically. I think that's a very astute point. You have to make yourself vulnerable in order to be a real friend. I also think that a big difference between the late 18th century, early 19th century and today is that politicians were really thinking, especially intellectual politicians like Madison or Hamilton, they were really thinking about the nature of friendship. You know, you mentioned Aristotle and Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics has a full account of how crucial friendship is to human flourishing. And he also sees friendship as the source of concord, which is the value that enables us to live together as citizens of a republic. So for Aristotle, and I think this was true for Madison as well, friendship wasn't just an individual idea, but also a model of what political cooperation among political friends could look like. And the trouble is that, and you, you, you hinted at this, sometimes those friendships can turn into relationships of enemies. And when someone is your political enemy, you don't just disagree with them. Often you actually want to destroy them. Hmm. And the trick to living in a republic is to remember that when you disagree with someone, they could still be your friend in some basic sense. Right. And then you can continue to live together in a republic. But if you reach the point 
where you define the person on the other side of you as your existential enemy so that you feel you have to destroy them, that breaks the underlying bonds of political republicanism. And if you ask me what scares me the most about our political world today, mm -hmm. it's that people on both sides of the aisle have fallen into the temptation of seeing each other as their their deep political enemies, their moral enemies, and therefore thinking, you know, how do I destroy the people on the other side instead of thinking, look, you and I really disagree with each other on this particular point, but we're committed to living together in the same nation and in the same republic. So let's remember that. And remember, we're going to have to agree some of the time and we're going to have to compromise at least vis-a-vis you know, external enemies. And if we don't do that, I think it's going to be really hard for us to sustain the kind of republicanism, the kind of commitment to democratic governance that we've managed to to stick with ever since Madison. Absolutely. It reminds me of the line from late Justice Scalia on his friendship with late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I attack ideas, not people, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, that friendship, which... I would say not only was it a friendship, but they were both very concerned, both Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg, that it be seen by everybody else as a friendship. Mm -hmm. I, I often thought that the most important aspect of that friendship for the two of them was its public aspect. They wanted it to be known that they were friends, even though they so deeply disagreed about the meaning of the Constitution and then how to interpret statutes and all of the day-to-day -day business of the Supreme Court. They so rarely agreed with each other on anything that was important or a big ticket. But they wanted everybody to know that it was possible to disagree with somebody while still having respect for that person. And that's a message that we, we can't get too much of that message and we're in some danger of forgetting it. Absolutely. So speaking of partisanship, when did Madison's political life begin? And what did Madison's lives teach us about partis partisanship and pol partisan politics um, that we could apply today? His political life began when he was in his early 20s, and the American Revolution took place. And he tried to be a soldier in the militia. He, he wasn't very good at it. He was, um, he was prone to terrible, terrible headaches, what we would today call migraine headaches, which made it hard for him to be a soldier. But he found a role at the Virginia Convention to write their own constitution, their state constitution, in which, though very young, the education he had gotten at Princeton enabled him to make really good suggestions, including suggesting that a guarantee of religious liberty specify that every citizen of Virginia should enjoy equal religious liberty. And that was a, an innovation to suggest at the time, and it was adopted by other people participating in that, in that drafting process. And so, in fact, interestingly, his first entrance into political life actually came in the context of drafting a constitution, which is pretty fascinating. And then he was sort of off to the races and he very quickly got elected to, to various offices and, and played that role. In that era though, politics was not yet deeply partisan. That partisanship didn't emerge for Madison even after the first constitution was, was drafted when the ratification process began, even then the Federalists and Anti-Federalists in Madison's view, were not genuinely political parties, or at least he didn't want them to be political mm -hmm. parties. It wasn't until the 1790s when he saw Hamilton influencing Washington to interpret the Constitution very, very loosely and broadly to give more and more power to the federal government than he believed it had that Madison decided it was time to go partisan mm -hmm. in order to protect what he thought of as the fundamental structure of the Constitution. Why was Madison so concerned about factions, and how did his constitutional design address these concerns? The worry that Madison had, which was shared by many political thinkers of his era, was that if you had an elected government and elected representatives didn't stand up for the interests of the whole, but rather stood for the narrow interest of the constituents who elected them, they would form what we would call today interest groups and that they called at the time factions that created a kind of deep contradiction over the question of how the political unit, whether it's the state or the federal government, 
should behave. And the worry was that those factions, what we would today call, call interest groups, would capture the overall government and then run the government in the interests of their subgroup, say of the very rich or the very poor, mm -hmm. in a way that would distort what Madison thought of and what other politicians of his day and political theorists of his day thought of as the true public interest, which was supposed to serve everybody. So that was his initial worry. And the idea that he came up with, the original idea, the thing that makes him most significant in the history of political thought, was ultimately in the drafting of the Constitution and then in the process of seeking to ratify it, to argue that in a constitutional scheme, you could play off different actors in the system against each other so as to balance the dangers, balance power, and thereby reduce the dangers of one faction grabbing control. And this is the famous thing which Madison said in the Federalist Papers, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. So if Congress was interested in ambition and wanted to elevate the interests of Congress, it would be countermanded by an executive that would be interest in, would, that would serve the interests of the executive and by a judiciary that was interested in serving the interests of the rule of law and of the judiciary. And so what we think of as the balancing of different parts of government against each other through the separation of powers was his idea of a solution to the problem a faction. And Madison hoped at the time of drafting the Constitution that there wouldn't have to be any political parties as a consequence. That didn't turn out to be true. He was wrong about that, as he himself subsequently discovered. But the part that he was right about, at least in part, was that the different branches of government were capable of counterbalancing each other to some meaningful degree and enabling Republican government to survive rather than falling entirely into the hands of one branch of government that would put an end to democracy altogether. So why did Madison create his own political party? Was he being a hypocrite? Well, I wouldn't call it hypocrisy. I would call it learning a lesson and realizing you were wrong about something and then having to change your position. You know, I mean, it, in, in Madison's day, it was not considered to be hypocrisy to say, I was wrong and I've learned something. Uh, you know, in our, today in our politics, we, we don't have as much tolerance for the idea that sometimes you can sincerely believe in something and then be wrong and then change mm -hmm. your mind. Um, and Madison essentially was forced to realize that the Constitution that he had done so much to design hadn't, in fact, obviated the need for political parties because it turned out, in his view, that the Federalists, Hamilton and Washington, were seizing greater power for the federal government relative to the people mm -hmm. by, in the first instance, um, running a national debt so that there would be powerful bond markets that would, in turn, promote the possibility of the government borrowing money in order for the government to do bigger things. And... Um, then getting Congress to agree to that by, for example, chartering a national bank that was also designed to help the United States do big things. And Hamilton hoped that eventually this would lead the United States to become a naval power, a global naval power, and that in turn will let the United States become an empire, first a naval empire and then potentially even a, a land empire as well. And Madison looked at all of these things as completely illegitimate under the Constitution. Hamilton justified them by saying they were within the power of Congress under the general its power to provide for the general welfare. And Madison said there is no independent constitutional power to provide for the general welfare. I was there when we drafted Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, and that's just not within Congress's power, including the power to, to charter a national bank. And so the bank fight became one of several fights that Madison had. It became the most significant and important one. And that is the fight that made him realize I need to start a political party because I need to convince the American people that they have to stop the Federalists. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, I'm not a faction. The Federalists are a faction because they're standing up for the interests of the government. I'm standing up for the interests of the people. So the party that I'm creating with Thomas Jefferson will not be a political party at all. It'll be a party against political parties. <laughs> and of course, that's not true. I mean, every political party is a political party, mm -hmm. and every political party likes to say that it stands for the general good and that the other side is standing for only the particular interests of its party faithful. And so Madison, to an important degree, inaugurated that American practice, 
of condemning your political opponents by saying, well, I speak for the whole, but you guys only speak for yourselves. Hence the naming of the, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, their strategic naming. <laughs> yeah, a lot of strategic naming there, right? I mean, Madison would have called himself a Federalist during the ratification of the Constitution, but then Hamilton sort of took that name Federalist and, and used it to describe himself and the party of, of Washington. And so Madison and Jefferson had to come up with a different name, which is why they came up with Democratic Republicans, or Republicans for short, so in trying to grab the good things, you know, they said, well, we care about what the people want. So, yeah, they and so they ended up being they didn't but they didn't call themselves anti-federalists because the anti-federalists were the people who had opposed the Constitution and they believed they were standing in favor of the Constitution. So back to constitutional design, would you say Madison's Constitution was a work of genius and how did it differ from any other Constitution in world history? Well, to begin with, it differed radically because there hadn't been very many written constitutions at all. Um, there had been some state constitutions, um, and you could describe some of the constitutions of some European countries as quasi-written. But the idea of a written constitution for a whole country from top to bottom was, was pretty darn new. What made it most remarkable, though, was the structure that we call federalism, namely the idea that there was a central government, a national government, and there were also state governments. And it had been believed as a matter of political orthodoxy by thinkers about politics that you couldn't have a combination of a genuine national government with genuine state governments. They called that the fallacy of imperium in imperio, the fallacy of one sovereign inside of another sovereign. The idea was that to be sovereign means to have the last say when it comes to government, to have absolute power. Mm -hmm. And if the federal government or the national government is the true sovereign, then the state governments aren't sovereign. And if the state governments are sovereign, then the federal government can't be sovereign. And Madison really solved that problem by proposing that the federal government would govern citizens and the state governments would govern the citizens of their states, but that the federal government wouldn't govern the states themselves and the state governments would not govern the federal government. And that may sound obvious to us because we learned about that in eighth grade civics, but at the time it was a massive transformation in thinking about what sovereignty was. It's what the late, uh, sorry, it's what Justice Kennedy, when he was still on the court, he's not late, he's still very much alive, but he's no <laughs> longer on the court, uh, referred to when he said that the framers, quote, split the atom of sovereignty, mm. which is a kind of fancy, Justice Kennedy likes to say things in fancy ways, is fancy way of saying that they broke the idea that sovereignty was just ultimate authority that couldn't be divided. They showed that sovereignty could be divided in complicated ways and then balanced. And that really was an epochal act of genius. That, that took a mode of thinking, a clarity of thought that was vastly important. Now, it's just important to note that it also wasn't perfect in the sense that Madison thought that there should be some body, some entity, they would have the ability to overturn state laws if they were unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. At the time, it wasn't obvious that the Supreme Court would have that authority. And so he wanted to create some council, some entity, some body of censors who would have this authority. And he kept on proposing this in the Constitutional Convention. I think I counted in my book that he proposed it six or seven separate times. And each time the other delegates just laughed it off. And he didn't get it in the Constitution. And when he left Philadelphia, he was actually very disappointed that he hadn't gotten that because he was worried that it would lead to eventual conflict between the states and the federal government. And of mm -hmm. course, in a sense, that is what happened when the Civil War came. The states that seceded claimed they had a right under the Constitution to secede. The federal government said they didn't have the right to secede. And the only way to resolve the problem was to fight a civil war over it. So in that sense, there was a flaw in the design that we got and if Madison had still been alive at that time, he would have said, I told you, I told you, you know, the ultimate, there had to be some ultimate decision body to resolve these conflicts. And the Constitution, as originally drafted, didn't include that. And so then after the 14th Amendment was enacted, we came to accept the idea that it was up to the Supreme Court to strike down unconstitutional state laws. Many constitutions in history were uh, verbal oral and not written, was it essential for us as a civilization to get to the idea of a written constitution to be able for Madison to create this idea of federalism in the proposal of the U.S. Constitution? And what would you say is easier to amend, a verbal or a written constitution? 
I think you're asking a fascinating question. The reason to need a written constitution is if you're starting a new country with new political arrangements under conditions where lots and lots of people are literate and power is going to be pretty broadly shared. The way that unwritten constitutions work is that they rely on custom, which requires a lot of time, and they typically rely on a small elite, which has the responsibility to interpret the custom to say whether what the government is doing is or isn't consistent with that constitutional custom. Now, could you have a customary federalism? You sort of could. Arguably, the British Empire, when it as it evolved, had a kind of quasi-federal structure in terms of the relationship between the colonies and the the British, uh, you know, the, the the British monarchy. It wasn't exactly like federalism. They didn't call it federalism, but scholars of federalism, like Professor Alison Lacroix, point out, um, Professor Dan Holzebosch, they point out that that imperial past was part of the backdrop against which the ideas of federalism developed. So I want to say that in principle, in theory, you could maybe have developed a kind of unwritten federalism, Mm -hmm. but you couldn't have done it under conditions where you were making it up from scratch and you didn't have a tradition to rest upon. And also you couldn't have done it under conditions where you wanted most ordinary people to understand how things worked, to have a say in how things worked and to share power. Because for that, You need people to be able to vote for laws and rules and principles that they understand. And for that, you need to put them into writing. In terms of amendment, you know, how hard it is to amend a written constitution entirely depends on what provision you put in it for amendment. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution makes it really hard to amend the Constitution, right? Unless you have a Mm -hmm. constitutional convention, which is hard to call, it requires two-thirds of Congress plus three-quarters of the state legislatures. And... That's a very high bar, which is why we haven't amended the Constitution that many times. Right. Unwritten constitutions get amended not by written amendment, but they get written. They get amended by the gradual process of elites changing their customs and practices to fit new circumstances. So in some way, that can be easier to do. And there are those who believe that our Constitution, though you can only formally amend it by Article 5, has been effectively amended by the Supreme Court's body of interpreting the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I I tend not to use that terminology, but um, there are people who think that the Constitution has actually been amended in practice, whether it's good or bad, by the Supreme Court's active interpretation. And if that were true, that would be an example of amendment of an unwritten, unwritten amendment, as it were, of a written Constitution. Right. The question of judicial review. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, Even if you, there are different kinds of judicial review. You don't have to think that all judicial review is created equal. Um, But, you know, there are people who think that the Supreme Court has so evolved the Constitution that it's effectively amended it. And there are some people like Professor Bruce Ackerman who thinks that's a good thing. And then there are lots of critics who think that that sort of thing has happened, that it's a bad thing. I tend to think it's not quite the same thing as an amendment. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of evolutionary practice that you get in a country where it's really hard to amend the Constitution. If it's really hard to do a formal amendment, the country's still got to change. You know, It's mm-hmm. not practically doable to run a country now the same way that it was run you know, 230 or 240 years ago. Uh, all Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes you know, famously said that, that the, in, in 1921, that the, you know, the, the framers had tried to bring to life an organism and that organism had a life you know it was it was by metaphor a blueprint for an actual living being and in his view if a being didn't evolve it would die you know if the republic didn't evolve the republic would die and so he thought that interpretation of the constitution should be performed with a with an awareness of the need of the organism to evolve Um, justice scalia thought the opposite. He liked to say, only slightly humorously, that the opposite of a living constitution is a dead constitution. And he's perfectly happy with a dead constitution. <laughs> um, you know, he always said it with a little chuckle. Um, but at the same time, he formally disputed the idea that you could evolve the constitution. It's an interesting disagreement between Justice Scalia and Justice Holmes, who in many other things, Justice Scalia really admired. Was Madison's constitutional design compromised or fulfilled by the amendments? Well, the 14th Amendment, I would say, really fulfilled his vision, but not necessarily the vision that he convinced the other delegates of. I mean, he wanted a constitutional arrangement whereby some entity, he didn't think it had to be the Supreme Court, 
would have the final say about the meaning of the Constitution in case of a dispute. And he didn't have that in the original Constitution, but the 14th Amendment effectively created that, effectively gave the Supreme Court that authority. So in that mm-hmm. sense, the 14th Amendment was very much a fulfillment of what Madison had hoped would be present in the original Constitution, but had failed to get. So he would have been very happy about that aspect of it for sure. Um, with respect to complicated questions like the separation of powers and the evolving power of the executive, it's harder to know exactly what Madison would have thought. He himself you know, began his partisan part of his career by arguing that the Constitution should be interpreted very narrowly with respect to the powers of the federal government. But then when he was president, towards the end of his presidency, he actually admitted that although he thought that the Constitution did not authorize the chartering of a national bank, everyone else had disagreed with him over time, and Congress had repeatedly chartered a national bank. They'd done it twice, and the public had sort of embraced it. And so he said there are some constitutional questions which come to be, he said, liquidated, which is his way of saying resolved over time, so that the meaning of the Constitution now was not the meaning that it had originally been. And so he said he therefore no longer believed that the chartering of the National Bank should be treated as unconstitutional, even though he had been sure that it was unconstitutional. And he mm-hmm. sort of took the view of, I was there, I had wrote the Constitution, this is unconstitutional. So he clearly believed in the possibility for the Constitution to evolve under at least some circumstances. And in that sense, he might have been okay with the direction that, say, executive power took, because it was evolutionary, even though in his own life, he strongly opposed the idea of the strong executive. And even when he was president, he did not go anywhere near as far as many other presidents presidents went to um, to exercise independent executive power. Speaking of Madison as president, how did his lives as genius and partisan influence his presidency? They influenced him in a, in a few different ways. His career as a constitutional genius made him very concerned to respect what he thought of as the boundaries put in place by the Constitution. And to give you one very concrete example, during the War of 1812, when it was going very badly, some of the New England states were thinking they should cut and run and basically um, make a separate peace with Britain. And they held a convention in Hartford, Connecticut, where they were very close to talking about disunion. And any other president would have, you know, sent in federal troops, and block or block the convention from occurring. And Madison just let it run. He just let it happen. Apparently believing that the importance of the First Amendment was so great that even if the free speech was endangering the Republic, it had to be allowed to occur. Um, he also, um, his time as partisan was relevant in that he ran his presidency from the standpoint of somebody who really didn't want the Federalists to come back into power. Mm-hmm. And that actually was true. You know, I mean, After, you know, eight years of Jefferson, who was a Republican, and eight years of Madison, who was a Republican, we got eight years of Monroe, who was a Republican. So there were 24 years of Virginian Republican rule. Um, And that was a reflection of the the partisan desire to put an end to partisanship, to basically have a one state, a one party state, which they they came very close to, to having in that period of time. Why should law school students care about James Madison? Law school students should care about James Madison because without him, we wouldn't have a country, we wouldn't have a legal system, and we wouldn't have the constitution that undergirds the the rest of our body of law. They should also care about him because he's somebody who embodies the attempt of the framers to get it right alongside the reality that sometimes they got it wrong. And he's a good example of somebody who, in my view at least, is worthy of admiration, notwithstanding that he also had many aspects of his character that weren't worthy of admiration, particularly holding slaves and not divesting himself of those slaves and compromising on slavery in the Constitution. So he shows you that our our country is based on a complex historical reality that has both good and bad in it. And the job of law students is to grapple for the next generation and for the future with how we make a country that's just and fair on the fundamentals that were created by framers who were great men and were also at the same time fallible, limited human beings. Excellent answer. Well, thank you so much, Professor Feldman, for joining us today for another episode of the FedSoc Films podcast. It's my great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Our guest today is Noah Feldman, Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and author of The Three Lives of James Madison, 
genius, partisan, and president. You can watch our film Madison and the Fight for the Constitution, an official selection at the 2022 Richmond International Film Festival, right now on YouTube, Facebook, or at fedsoc.org. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of the FedSoc Films podcast. If you like this episode, please leave us a review. As always, the Federalist Society doesn't take any positions on the issues discussed. That's a wrap. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 